I think it's time to introduce four absolutely fantastic physicists who are going to be telling you all about the four experiments that have been going on deep underground in Switzerland over the last 10 years. Uh, so to start with, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Sudan Pamavasaran. He's a lecturer at the University of Bristol. He's worked on the CMS experiment at LHC for 10 years, uh, having achieved his PhD at Royal Holloway University of London, working on the Barbar experiment at Slack in 2010. If you just Google Barbar and Slack, um, you can find out what those are, but I think he'll also tell you later. Um, so secondly, we have Barbara Shahasha. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Shasha. Um, she's a researcher at the Laboratorio Nazionale di Friscati of the National Institute of Nuclear Physics in Italy. Uh, scientific activities in the field of high energy experimental physics, mainly studying flavor physics through participation in the CHLOE experiment at LNF and the LHCB experiment at CERN on the Large Hadron Collider from 2011. Thirdly, we have another Italian, Monica Donofrio. Uh, she's the team leader of the Liverpool group at the Atlas experiment at the LHC. Previously, she studied her undergraduate at the University of Pisa and then did a PhD at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. Since 2010, she's worked at the University of Liverpool, uh, but she also did a postdoc at IFAE in Barcelona. She's been working on the Atlas uh, experiment since 2002, working on searches for new physics, in particular supersymmetry and dark. Uh, oh, I cut off the end there. It just says and dark. I think that would be dark matter, but if it's dark energy, I do apologize. Um, and finally, uh, our fourth speaker is Jan Fieter Grosser Oestinghaus. Uh, he's section leader of the CERN ALICE Particle Physics and Performance Group and the ALICE Analysis Coordinator. He achieved his PhD at the University of Münster in Germany in 2009. He's worked at CERN since 2006 and has been a staff member since 2012. So please welcome all of our panel. So first, I'd like to start with Jan really, and that's just the real basic question, what is the Large Hadron Collider? Where is it? And what does it do? Yeah, thank you very much, Martin. So the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, is the largest particle accelerator and collider in the world. And let me explain you a bit what that means. So the name contains the words Large Hadron and Collider. So let's dissect this a bit. So large is easiest explained. The LHC has a circumference of 27 kilometers and is located about 100 meters below the ground of Switzerland and France. And uh, in this photograph, you see the Geneva area with CERN on the right, the Lake of Geneva and the Alps in the background. And then you see this yellow circle, uh, which is the LHC, and you also see its four large experiments indicated. CERN is directly on the border between Switzerland and France, and uh, it is partially in both countries, and so is the LHC. The name LHC also contains hadron, not only large. So this is a category of particles made of quarks. And in practice, up to now, out of all the many hadrons that there exist, the LHC has accelerated mostly protons, but also the ions, xenon and lead for short periods. So lastly, what is a collider? So a collider is a very complex machine which accelerates particles to a very high speed, which is actually close to the speed of light. When you accelerate an object faster and faster and its speed becomes closer to the speed of light, its weight, or as we physicists say, its mass increases. The reason is that no object can uh, fly faster or be faster than the speed of light. So when we indicate the speed of something, we don't give actually the speed, but we use its energy. And the LHC, which is the most powerful collider ever built, accelerates protons up to 6.5 TeV, and this means 6.5 tera electron volt. So from comparison, if you remember this old non-flat TVs, so this with a, which were a bit heavy and uh, and uh, seem to have some big bulb inside, these accelerated electrons higher than that. And that's actually very challenging to achieve. So the, the journey of uh, the protons in the LHC starts from a hydrogen bottle. Hydrogen consists of a proton and an electron. The electron is removed, and then the proton travels through a number of accelerators. First, we have straight ones called linear accelerators, and then circular ones. The LHC is the last circular accelerator through which the protons travel. Why are those actually circular? Well, it takes time to accelerate protons to such an energy. So they do travel uh, about 11,000 times per second around the ring, which you see on the image, and accelerating them takes about 15 minutes. So you can imagine how often they have to go around until they have the speed we want, and we have to keep them exactly in the same spot all the time. For that, we need large magnets. and um, Otherwise, if you would have not a, a magnet, the particle would just travel straight. So one of the main elements of the LHC are so-called dipole magnets. It is uh, one, about 1,200 of them. And uh, you see here a picture 
where uh, this blue element on the left uh, is a dipole magnet. And you see here the LHC tunnel and how at the, at the end of the picture, you see this light bending around the ring. So on the right side, there's some space left. What's this for? Well, this is actually to go to the place where you may have to work or repair something or bring something. And this can be a few kilometers sometimes uh, as there are only X, eight access points to the LHC ring. So in order to operate, these dipole magnets have to be cooled so that they can be superconducting. And they have to be cooled to minus 271.3 degrees centigrade, which is very close, actually, to the lowest temperature that can be reached at all, which we call absolute zero. And um, just as a fact, it's also colder, one degree colder than the universe. So if you imagine we would be alone in the universe, if there is no alien species somewhere which has built a similar device than the LHC, at CERN and in the LHC, we have created the coldest place in the universe, which I find quite, quite amazing. The LHC itself consists of two rings, so one for particles traveling clockwise, the other for particles traveling anti-clockwise. And once they have reached their final energy, these two, two particle beams are steered together into collision, in four collision points, where the four large experiments are located. So we have ALICE, CMS, LHCB, and ATLAS. And you will hear more about that later. A collision has then twice the energy of the single beam. So if you have 6.5 TB protons, you reach 13 TB collisions. And once they collide, we produce millions of collisions per second, which then the experiments inspect and eventually record for later analysis. We provide then continuous collisions for about 10 hours before we have to fill new protons. And typically, the LHC runs 24-7 throughout the year. You have a number of trained operators and engineers who work on that. And um, you can imagine they really have to do, do a tremendous job because the machine is so sensitive that it has been adjusted even to the phase of the moon. Depending where the moon is due to its gravitational force, the length of the, this 27 kilometer long ring actually changes by about 200 micrometers. So why do we need such a device to produce such large energy collisions? So this large collision energy enables particles to be produced, which have not been seen before, and can then answer some of the open puzzles which you have in particle physics. So that's, I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by, by, by that change just due to the moon. That's amazing. So we can understand the questions that you're trying to answer at the LHC, but um, Barbara, would you be able to give us a brief summary into particle physics and how we sort of think the world is made and why, why that model isn't actually, you know, we don't think that model's correct? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, we, maybe we should start from very ancient time. Uh, maybe the Greeks, uh, the idea that the reality among us is made of... Uh, uh, small bricks uh, and so you need just a few bricks uh, to describe all uh, around us uh, and this idea uh, okay went hidden uh, for many centuries and uh, jump up again uh, in the 19th centuries when uh, the idea of atoms uh, was uh, uh, brought to the uh, up the scientist and uh, uh, the idea of having few elementary particles uh, was uh, in some sense destroyed by the number of atoms that they were uh, they were uh, um, finding so if we uh, look uh, sorry uh, to this uh, plot of uh, it's not a plot but the notes uh, uh, of uh, sorry why okay this uh, on the on the left is uh, the notes taken by mendeleev trying to trying to organize uh, the about 60 elements known uh, at that time about 150 years ago to find some regularities uh, because uh, he had the idea that uh, that would be would be something more deeper more profound and now we know how end up uh, this is the uh, periodic tables of the, of the elements and uh, this is a uh, fantastic but having uh, uh, about 120 ele elementary particles uh, uh, is and was too much and at some point the idea uh, arrived that uh, all the, these varieties of uh, atoms uh, comes from just a few particles so it seems like a dream you can just have uh, one proton one neutron one electron so three kind of particles and this could apparently explain the variety of this table. And this was around the, the, uh, the, the, the 30s or the uh, 20th 20 century. And uh, 
apparently it was a dream, but at some point uh, there was a new particle discovered by chance. There was a physicist, uh, Isaac Rabin, saying who ordered that, because it was uh, just an electron, just uh, 200 times more uh, heavy than uh, the electron. This was being found uh, in, the, in the cosmic rays. It's called muon. Uh, and uh, this was really strange because uh, uh, this one was not needed for understanding the, 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 the world uh, and the periodic table and uh, all the experiments. But uh, this was not the, the first new particle. In fact, uh, with the passing of the years, uh, many and many were discovered. Uh, in particular, in between uh, the 1953, for six years and until 1963, uh, about 60 new particles, new, new hadrons were discovered in the cosmic rays uh, and in the accelerators. Uh, and uh, they were similar to the protons, uh, so-called hadrons, uh, and no, no way of uh, uh, considering them uh, elementary. And uh, likely uh, uh, we had a new idea to build a new table. This arrives uh, in many, many steps, in fact. Uh, now we have this uh, fantastic uh, uh, table with uh, really few elements, at least uh, uh, compared with the periodic table. And uh, I could speak for hours describing the discovery of each of these. Uh, this, each time has been a, an adventure. But let's content, concentrate in the, in the first column. So we have uh, uh, two kinds of quarks, the up and the down an electron and a neutrino. And this is enough uh, to explain uh, all the universe around us, essentially. What to, all of, uh, that we can see is made by this, uh, these uh, uh, elements. In particular, uh, the proton is made of two quarks of up type and uh, three, uh, one quark of uh, down type. So it's just uh, uh, three quarks uh, um, together. The other particles, so we have other four quarks and other electrons, heavier electrons, are not needed uh, for, uh, to explain the, the world around us. We just discovered them. On the right, instead, uh, you have not the bricks, uh, but the, the connection, the we, we call mediator, so the particles that al allow the one on the left to interact among, uh, among them. Uh, we start, we have the photon, which is say, responsible of the charge interaction, uh, the well-known electromagnetic uh, force. Then the column on the, on, the, on the middle, which are the mediator of the weak force, uh, is the thing that, uh, uh, if you want to uh, uh, keep the stars and the sun uh, uh, burning and giving us the energy to, to, to live. And on the right, the gluons that just keep the quark together, and in particular keep the protons that we need to, to exist. Uh, there was a missing uh, part uh, because all this fantastic uh, uh, list of particles that co is called the standard model, uh, in theory, uh, doesn't foresee any mass. So all these particles should have been uh, massless. While in the experiments, we, we, they were finding uh, uh, different value of masses. And at some point in the 64, two different uh, group of people, uh, so uh, Peter X and uh, uh, and Glare Brew to, to people from France, and the idea of how to give mass also in the theory. And this is important because at the end, the theory must describe the reality. And this was the idea of uh, the X, X boson. And uh, it is very interesting to see this uh, chart prepared by the economist uh, uh, when the X has been discovered. And this is really interesting to see uh, the time taken between the theoretical explanation, uh, so the blue line, the vertical blue line for each uh, particle, and the red one, then the, the time when uh, each particle has been uh, discovered. And so what we learned from this table is that uh, it, takes, it takes some time between the idea of something and uh, finding and be sure that uh, this exists. We have some surprise. The third line is the muon, where first it has been discovered, and then we say, ah, OK, we have to put in the theory, and then all the others. And uh, the last one, uh, the last two that have been discovered have been the top quark and the tau neutrino, so the heavier particle of, the, of, this, uh, of this, uh, this table. And the very last was the famous X boson, and it uh, took uh, something like 40 years uh, 
between uh, our idea of how to give mass of all the, these particles and uh, um, how be sure that uh, this uh, mechanism could, uh, could work. And uh, even if the standard model is really fantastic and is working perfectly, we know, we know that uh, is not enough, uh, really. And uh, so we have to go on. That's fantastic, Barbara. So now moving on. Um, so we know that the LHC is really helping us to get to not just it's, it's not it's not just like a science experiment where, you know, you're sort of mixing things, but you can understand how the world works. This is really digging into the fundamental sort of fabric of how of how the laws of nature work and how the universe is constructed. So so what what do we hope to find by by doing all this and, and, and what do we hope that we can add to the standard model? Well, hi, hi. So yeah, that's uh, well, that's really true. I mean, um, we can really do a lot of things, uh, and uh, with with the LAC, and uh, um, and we want to know more because uh, I think it's fair to say the more we uh, we dig into things, uh, and uh, the more questions arise, uh, and the more things we want to learn, um, and certainly yes, the, as as Barbara was uh, was inferring, yeah, the standard model is is clearly uh, very successful to uh, to explain our daily life. But we want to know more because we want to really understand uh, how we got here and uh, the, the, how the universe has uh, has become what, what we see around us. And perhaps, I mean, I, I have um, I, I, I wanted to kind of uh, um, use this beautiful picture that uh, I mean, it's very colorful um, and uh, and very instructive. Actually, uh, they managed to concentrate like something like 13 billion years in one plot, which is uh, a Astonishing. So, uh, so if you if you if you look at the in the in the right hand side, that that is basically our today. I mean, today and uh, our daily life. And on the other side is uh, the moment of the Big Bang. So in the middle there is uh, this uh, this nice evolution in time. And why this is relevant for the LAC is because uh, when we look at the stars, we can definitely uh, from today we can we can go and understand the history of the universe uh, up to a certain point, uh, which is. Uh, uh, indicated by that uh, that vertical line but then if we want to understand what happened before so really really what uh, how we got from the explosion to 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 the to the to the stars and galaxy um, we we do want to study uh, and to, we, we want we do want to go back in time and now if you if you look attentively at the at the slides you see that uh, that on the top uh, uh, on the top part there is an LHC protons and LHC heavy ion and you see at the energy at which it corresponds i mean that's that's the key point so the universe at the beginning of time was really hot so really a lot of energy and this energy can be uh, recreated and reproduced at the lac of course we cannot go to the moment zero but we are very very close and so 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 with that uh, i mean we can actually uh, produce particles that in our daily life eventually are not uh, we don't see because i mean the building blocks are much simpler but uh, but they can be uh, reproduced at a higher energy and eventually also new particles of which we don't have uh, uh, for which we don't we don't know much um, and you were you were mentioning about the, the new physics beyond the standard model. I mean, so what we want to understand, uh, why we need to go there. It's it's actually another uh, an, an important chapter of uh, high energy physics. The, the standard model is definitely um, is definitely not enough uh, to to explain the history of the of the universe. Uh, um, so even starting just from 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 the first moments, uh, matter and antimatter, for example, should have been uh, produced the, with the exact same quantity. So there should have been a complete symmetry between the two. But we are done of matter, so somehow the antimatter is is, is gone, and of this matter that uh, that uh, in reality of the matter that compose the universe so we we do not know everything and in fact i mean when you look at the nice uh, galaxies and stars uh, there is something in the middle we know from from uh, from uh, from uh, gravitational measurements uh, that uh, cosmological measurements uh, that there is some kind of matter in the middle that it's dark that we don't see, and that's the dark matter that you were mentioning uh, before about the thing that I that I have uh, uh, worked on, and um, and it's uh, and this dark matter it's actually could actually be. Mm, 
something like five, mat five times more than the matter um, of, of the normal matter of the standard model. So um, there are, I mean, in addition to that, there is uh, there is really many more uh, many more open questions that uh, that we have in the standard model, like uh, why gravity is so different with respect to the other forces, or uh, why there are only three families. I mean, uh, nobody knows, and in principle, that's not written anywhere. Why the neutrinos are, have such a small mass? In fact, the standard model doesn't even predict the mass of the neutrinos. So, so I think. In, in the last decades, I think it's fair to say generations of theorists that have really tried to think about very hard about uh, theories beyond the standard model. And uh, these theories, uh, usually they theorize the presence of other uh, particles, usually heavier, that uh, eventually were present at the beginning of, uh, of, uh, of in, in, this, in this kind of uh, uh, big um, uh, primordial soup. But uh, um, they go with the very, nice uh, funny names sometimes like supersymmetry dark sector ex extra dimension and we'll touch on a few of them but uh, but the key point is then that that we as experimentalists we try to uh, to really find uh, eventually if there is new physics and if there is uh, um, if there is uh, there is any of these theories is in fact too, true and uh, so with proton proton collision and also heavy ion collision at the possible highest energy with the LAC we can really try to shed some light uh, on the, uh, the 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 open questions of the of the standard model so that's uh, perhaps it's uh, like the beginning of a fascinating journey that we we have started 10 years ago and that is still continuing that's absolutely fascinating Monica thank you so much for that so so you've uh, people watching might have heard me say at the start we've got four scientists I introduced four scientists and I said there were four experiments as well um, but also many of you might be thinking well why do we need four experiments I mean it's just one big thing surely we could just have one so so Sudan I don't know if you could tell us why do we need four experiments and what do they all do yeah thank you yes yeah, so it's uh, actually a really interesting question about why we have uh, four experiments and uh, what they all do um so they all provide uh, a unique picture, basically, of what's going on um, in the uh, in the in the collisions after they collide at the experiments. And the way I say the way that uh, the word that I use is picture, because actually we like to think of our detectors as cameras, uh, a bit like cameras. They're taking photos of the collisions after they happen, and then we try and study them in detail and try and figure out exactly what happened in the collision and after the collision. And you know, one of the things we like to we like to think about is to try and get the most out of those collisions, the most out of the data. And one of the, you know, if you think about it, having four independent collaborations or four independent experiments with all with different teams of scientists and engineers and IT people and technicians, you know, they've all got different ideas. And so we're we're kind of coming at the data from different angles. And that gives us a much bigger kind of range of ideas to test uh, when we're looking at the data. So that's kind of one reason um, about why we have different experiments. Another one, actually, going back to the um, camera analogy, uh, I'm sure keen photographers out there know that you use different cameras, different lenses uh, for different types of picture that you want to take. Um, there's some suited better to things than some, than some others. That's also something that we really kind of use with our different experiments because they're not all identical and they're optimized and they're kind of uh, suited to different things. And that's something that, um, you know, I, I can talk about now and try and show you as I go through them. So the first ones I want to talk about are actually what we refer to as GPDs or general purpose detectors. Um, there's two of them, Atlas and CMS. These are the largest detectors um, at the LHC. Um, when I say large, uh, I mean large. Atlas is 46 meters in length and 25 meters high, 25 meters wide, uh, weighs 7,000 tons. So you can, uh, well, I'm not sure if you can imagine, but it is a, a really big piece of equipment. Um, and then the other one we have uh, is CMS, that's the second GPD. Um, it's actually a bit smaller, so it's 21 meters long, 15 meters high. 15 meters wide, uh, but it actually weighs twice as much as Atlas. It weighs 14,000 tons. And so that's where the C comes from in CMS, because uh, it's kind of compact and dense. Um, the GPDs are there to study a wide range of physics, you know, from things like the Higgs boson, which you may have heard of, uh, to dark matter, um, and kind of even more exotic things than that, as well as kind of more standard model type particles, things that we already know exist, but we want to find out um, more about them. 
Um, so th those are the GPDs. If we move on to uh, the other experiments, so we have two that actually are not so general, but they're a lot more focused on specific physics. Um, so we have one here, which is called LHCB. And I think it was uh, Monica, or no, it was Barbara that was talking about the difference between matter and antimatter. And this is really what this experiment is designed to look at, those small differences that we have between um, matter and antimatter. And it does this by looking at uh, a particle called a B quark or a beauty quark. That's where the B comes from in LHCB. So it looks at these types of particle in a lot of detail. And then the last experiment uh, is uh, called ALICE. And that's the last one I'm going to talk about. Now, this is also a kind of specialized experiment. And um, as Jan was saying, some part of the year, we don't actually collide protons. We collide heavy ions or lead ions, which are essentially the nuclei from elements. And uh, the reason we do this is to try and recreate some of the conditions after the Big Bang, where a really interesting state of matter um, existed called a quark gluon plasma. Now, Jan will actually talk a bit more about that later, and it's really interesting. But um, this is what this experiment, Alice, is, is really designed to study. Now, they, although I've said they're um, quite unique, um, they're also quite similar in some ways as they work on similar principles. You know, there's, there's things like um, trackers. They have trackers, these detectors. Um, so all of the experiments that I mentioned have trackers. These kind of map the trajectory of particles. They also have calorimeters, uh, which are designed to measure the energy of particles. Um, they all have really powerful magnets. The reason they have magnets is that um, by, by having a magnet, um, charged particles that are in the detector will actually bend as a result of the magnetic field. And this tells us quite a lot about the particles. It tells us, for example, whether they're charged or not. Um, charged particles will bend and particles with no charge won't. But it also tells us a bit more than that. Um, if we look at, for example, one of the um, uh, particles and as it goes through uh, a detector, let me just uh, share that. This might give you a better idea of how, how the different bits of the detector kind of work together to try and help us identify them and find out what's going on in the collision. So this is a, just like a, a transverse slice through the detector and the collision will be happening on the left hand side. And if you look, if you can see on the kind of uh, bottom of the bottom of the um, left hand side, there's a red curved line. So that's actually the path that an electron would take uh, through a detector. So you, you can see that it's actually curved and that's because of the magnetic field that's applied. Um, and it stops in the electromagnetic calorimeter where we measure its energy. Now, whether you can see at the top, there's like a faint blue dash line. So that actually represents the path of a photon. And um, a photon uh, is not charged, and so that's why it's not uh, not bending in the magnetic field. So we use these types of, uh, we use the detectors all together, um, and we come up with our picture of what actually happens um, in a collision. Now, one thing that is quite interesting that I don't have here on the slide um, is that some people might not know that all these collisions that are going on, we can't actually um, store them all. We can't store all the data from all of them. and there's a couple of reasons. Um, one, it's just a huge amount of data. We can't physically get it off the detectors and analyze it. And the second reason is not all of this data is actually interesting for us. And um, there's a lot of the data that we kind of won't learn that much from. And so we want to try and get all the interesting data um, in our kind of you know analysis, basically, when we look at it. So what we do is all of the detectors that I mentioned, all the experiments, they implement what we call a trigger system which is like a fil filter system. Um, so what it does is it decides whether or not an event is interesting or not. And then if it is interesting, it kind of saves it for us so we can look at it um, later and analyze it um, in detail. Now, one of the fascinating things about these trigger systems is they only have about three millionths of a second to make the decision to store the event or not. So you can imagine to kind of make a decision on that kind of time scale you need to use quite um, robust and reliable electronics. And that's what we do um, at the LHC. So I hope I've managed to give a picture of all the experiments and also try to kind of give you an understanding that there's such huge endeavors um, that we need really large collaborations to kind of make everything work. And we have thousands of people from 
hundreds of institutes working on them and all working together really to try and get this endeavor to be as successful as possible. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Sidan. We've actually now got a, a short video. So obviously we've been hearing a lot about these detectors and we've seen a few slides as well, but we've now actually got a short video from the Alice detector, um, which is not the one Sidan works on, um, but uh, that should give you a bit of a better idea of, uh, of what it looks like down there. Hello, I'm Dr. Pippa Wells, and I'm standing in the huge cavern that houses the Atlas experiment. The floor of the cavern is 100 meters under the Swiss countryside near Geneva and the detector completely fills it. It's, it's 44 meters long from this end where I'm standing to the other end at the far side of the cavern. Um, and the detector is 25 meters tall. The particles from the LHC meet at the exact center of the detector and the high energy from some of the protons can get converted into new particles that fly out through the detector layers. The innermost layers of the detector are very thin and very high granularity. They are to measure the tracks of charged particles and find the points of origin as they emerge from the collision area. Then outside um, this inner tracking detector is um, a set of detectors called calorimeters. That means energy measuring detector. They are much denser. They have things like layers of lead or iron between the sensor elements. Now, most of the particles actually get stopped in the calorimeters, but a few actually manage to escape. Um, in particular, muon particles that are charged particles that interact weakly in the calorimeters and can fly all the way through. So the outermost part of the detector is to measure the tracks of these muon particles. The sensors are arranged in cylinders around the interaction point, and then the ends of the cylinders are, are capped to make sure that we catch all of the particles. So the thing you can see behind me is the big wheel that caps the end of the muon detection system. So that's given you a little bit of an idea of, of what it's like down there and what one of those big detectors actually looks like in real life. So uh, as, as we've sort of been doing this event, we've been saying that it's been 10 years uh, since this Large Hadron Collider has been opened. And I'm sure many of you watching, if you say, you know, what's the Large Hadron Collider done? What's it for? Two words will definitely spring to mind. And those two words are Higgs boson. So, uh, Sudan, I wonder if you could uh, tell us a little bit about what the Higgs boson is and why it's important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, as uh, I think Barbara was saying um, when she was describing the kind of standard model, we had this kind of really great model um, and the only the problem or one of the problems with it or one of the major problems was that the uh, it wasn't able to give mass to the particles and we, we knew that the particles did have mass. So this was like a pretty big problem uh, for us. Luckily, in the mid 60s, um, we we had this team of scientists. So um, Robert um, Browst, um, Francois, Francois Anglais and Peter Higgs, who came up with this theory to, to, to solve this problem. and as a result of their theory, they predicted, the mechanism predicted something called uh, a Higgs field and an excitation or a manifestation of this Higgs field would be a Higgs boson. The way I like to think about it is the Higgs field is kind of like the ocean and uh, a Higgs boson is like a wave on that ocean. So it's just a little kind of blip, a little excitation. So, of course, uh, since, then, since then, we've been trying to find this particle because obviously it would solve a lot of questions that we have um, and, and would prove this theory. And so on the 4th of uh, July 2012, the Atlas and CMS uh, experiments announced the discovery of a particle which very much uh, resembled a Higgs boson. And uh, I can tell you that was a really kind of momentous day for science. Um, here's a picture of the auditorium and you can see it's completely packed. Um, Higgs himself is there somewhere, as well as uh, Angler. Um, and yeah, it was you know it was one of those kind of crazy days where it was uh, there was a real buzz around the place. <clears throat> you couldn't really walk; uh, you had to queue up to get into the auditorium. I had colleagues who queued up for several hours just to get in and, and hear the announcement of discovery. And so yeah, it was a really kind of great moment. Um, just to maybe talk a little bit about how the discovery kind of occurred. Well. I've got a couple of graphs here that I'll explain. Um, firstly, though, the Higgs can decay in, in, in numerous ways. It can be produced in numerous ways and decay in numerous ways. One of the ways that we were first trying to detect it was through its decay to two photons. So it's something that we, something that we refer to as gamma, gamma, gamma being a photon. So what we did was look at um, events where we had two photons and then try and see if there was anything there that didn't agree with our kind of current expectations 
And that's what you can kind of see on these two plots. The left one is from Atlas and the right one is from CMS. Now, the kind of smooth lines which are kind of going down, smooth distributions, which are dotted, actually, um, that, that's the kind of background line. So that's what we know to exist at this time. And anything that deviates from it, we can kind of, you know, infer that is, is something new. And the black points on these plots represent the actual data that we took um, at the LHC. And you can see at two points uh, on the left and the right, remarkably at very similar places, um, you can see these black points start to go up a bit. And you can see we've drawn a red line through it to show the little bump. And this is actually the Higgs boson decaying to two photons. So this is um, a common method that we use to search for new particles is, is something we call bump hunting. So we kind of look at the background that we have, the, the things we know are there, and then we look for deviations from that to see if there's enough deviations from it for us to kind of really claim that we can, that we can see something. Now, this was, um, you know, a really exciting time, as I've said, and, you know, this work result resulted in the Nobel Prize in 2013. Uh, going to Peter Higgs and Francois Anglais. Unfortunately, the third member of the, um, of the team had died at that point. And, and kind of contrary to this being the, the kind of culmination or end of, a, of an endeavor, it was, it, was, it was more like the start, actually. It was like the start of a new area of physics where we could look at the Higgs in detail, really study its properties and try and understand as much as we, as much as we could about it. And we've been doing that ever since. Um, in fact, only last month um, we we saw evidence of a of a new way that it decays, which is Higgs to two muons. Um, Barbara talked about muons in cosmic rays earlier earlier in the panel, and so we saw evidence of the Higgs decaying to that. So we're learning things about it all the time, and there's still a lot more that we can learn about it. I mean, it's still a new particle. Um, and I like to end this really by saying that you know we've got to continue studying the Higgs in as much detail as we can. Because after all, you know, if you think back to the electron, which was discovered in 1897, where would we be if we stopped, uh, to stop studying that when it was discovered? So uh, thanks for that, uh, Sudan. But it, it's not just the Higgs boson, is it? I mean, there's, there's been plenty of other science that's been going on uh, since that time. Monica, I believe you're going to tell us a bit about that. Yeah, definitely, yes. I mean, actually, there has been, uh, uh, I mean, many, many uh, papers. I mean, I think that it's it's really thousands of papers that uh, Atlas, uh, CMS, but also LACB and Alice have published. So it's it's definitely really a lot of things. And uh, I mean, of course, in, in like a few minutes, it's it's very hard to say, uh, to list all the achievements that uh, that we have, uh, we got at the uh, at the LAC experiments. And in particular, I mean, I'll, I'll probably try to list a few things from 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 Atlas and CMS, and and maybe I can um, I can attempt now uh, the uh, to show uh, uh, something that perhaps is going to be difficult to um, I mean let's see if I manage to explain this. So I think that uh, it's fair to say that uh, um, I mean there are many many measurements and many many searches for new physics that uh, we have been doing at this uh, the experiments that we are still doing now and um, even at the beginning from since the beginning 2010 when we started taking data uh, it was it was really a lot of work from a dedicated physicists to understand and the characteristics and the, to, to calibrate the detector and uh, which worked really really well the detectors and um, and then we started to 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 take uh, with the data taken we started to try to uh, rediscover and measure the standard model and the standard model in in really the best precision possible so what this plot is is that, so on the horizontal line you can probably not see it but it's like many kind of processes that you can have in the standard the model and so the, the, the on on one side on the left hand side is is the uh, all the processes with the w or z bosons the carrier of the weak force and on the right hand side are all processes characterized by the presence of one or two top quarks and why the dinosaurs well because i mean at the beginning i think it was already from 2011 to 2012 when we started to put together all these plots uh, the, and all these measurements is that they, they look like a dinosaur a little brontosaur so we called it the dino plot but how does it work uh, so so 
as I said, on the horizontal line, uh, you have all the possible events and kind of processes that, that uh, where these particles uh, appear. And then on the uh, on on the vertical line, well, you can think that uh, all the dots that are uh, close to the head of the dinosaur are uh, events and processes that are very frequent. And on the tails are all processes that are extremely rare. And so with them, we can do a lot of things. With the one that are very frequent, we can take the data from this and reconstruct very precisely the uh, characteristics of the standard model particles. I mean, take the top quark. The top quark was, is the heaviest of the quark, was discovered in 1995 at the Fermilab, but it was quite a rare event at that time. At the LAC, we can produce 10 top quark pairs every second. So it's really a lot of them, and we can really study that with, with very high precision and we we have measured its mass at the permeal level and same thing with the with the w boson i mean uh, despite the fact that it was discovered in 84 we are still really trying to dig into the characteristics of this um, of this and uh, just in, in 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 and we we just measured very precisely its uh, its mass um now, I mean, if you, if you go to the tails instead, there are all very rare processes. And in fact, if you take again the top, the top pairs can be produced together with the Higgs. And uh, I mean, and understanding the Higgs, uh, it's not just only identifying and find it, the beautiful plot that, that uh, Sudana was mentioning, but it's also studying all the, the, the couplings, how the Higgs behaves with all the other standard model particles. And in the case of the top pair, I mean, that's a very ra rare um, coupling that you have, but it's quite important. And in fact, I think it was only in 2018 that ATAS and CMS have announced the observation of this phenomenon. Now, I mean, this is actually a real event that shows you the, the green towers are the two photons from the Higgs and the little cones in the middle represents the, pro the products of the top. So it's, it's quite a fascinating uh, um, event. Um, but, but actually, I think that it's also important to say that, uh, I mean, you, you would decide, say, okay, but what about you, you measure the standard model processes? So, so something that you know that is there. But of course, if you measure it precisely, then you can also see if there are deviations from the prediction, you can understand if there is a new physics. And, uh, and I think that uh, um, the, the, the searches for new physics is certainly one important part of the physics program of uh, the, the GDP experiment. Um, personally, I mean, so, so we have been looking and we are looking for all um, possible theories, the one that I mentioned at the beginning, and the person I have been uh, really involved in the searches for supersymmetry and uh, now in a nutshell in this supersymmetry there are new particles that are so-called super partners of the standard model particle and uh, and uh, some of them go, they go with funny names so for instance the partner of the top quark is called stop or top quark and it's very important because this this is supposedly playing an important role in the, defining the Higgs the Higgs mass for example so we really looked for it from 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 the start even where uh, we didn't think that we could uh, we could achieve uh, results and uh, and uh, Yes, we haven't found that, but uh, but clearly, I mean, it's uh, I mean the the the, the search is still uh, still ongoing. And then another thing that, uh, if you allow me one second, the the to go back to the slides is, uh, I mean, we talked about dark matter, and and clearly, I mean, dark matter is can be can be anywhere. I mean, we 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 don't know how it is, and we don't know which mass it is. So now, and in this this figure, I think that it's nice because you see dark matter and the middle and all the rest is all the possible explanations of dark matter so each is 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 a possible explanation of dark matter and behind each there is a team of physicists at other CMS that are looking for uh, for this uh, this hypothesis and they are trying to 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 understand whether this hypothesis is true or or, or not and, and and this is not only at the at LAC but there is also some collaborative and synerg synergistic effort also with the uh, astro physics and cosmological experiment. So, so it's, in a nutshell, I think, I mean, yeah, in 10 years, we have achieved many things and, uh, and on, on different aspects. So, so that's, uh, that's certainly uh, very, uh, very exciting, I think. So, so that's, and that's only the proton-proton part. So that's... Uh, 
Thanks. That's fascinating. Thank you so much, Monica. So we've had, um, we've know, we've discovered the Higgs. We've, we're learning so much more about these other particles as well and how they decay. But you might remember at the start, Barbara was talking about using the LHC to sort of probe what was going on in the very hot, very energetic early universe. So, Jan, can you tell us a bit more about uh, what, what the LHC has told us about uh, the birth of, uh, of the universe? Yeah, indeed, we also study uh, a part of the evolution of the early universe. For one month uh, per year, we inject lead ions into the LHC, accelerate them, and bring them into collision. Now, compared to the proton, which we discussed earlier, a lead ion is much larger, and in a collision, we therefore create a larger volume with an incredible amount of energy compressed in it. Its temperature is uh, about 100,000 times the temperature of the core of the sun, so Dan mentioned this. And uh, that what happens is that uh, inside this hot and dense matter, even protons and neutrons melt into its constituents. And um, then we have free quarks and gluons, which we can study in what we call the quark gluon plasma. This is a state of matter that we had already in the, about 10 microseconds after the Big Bang. So 0. 0.00001 second after the Big Bang. And that's why also at the LHC, we sometimes say the collisions are mini bangs. Now, this hot and dense volume exists only for a small fraction of a second, but during this time, lots of interactions between the quarks and gluons happen, and then shortly after, particles are formed from the quark gluon plasma, which fly in all directions, and then they're measured by the detectors. So in such a lead-on-lead -lead collision, about 10,000 particles are produced, which require particular care when such collisions are studied in the detector. So I'd like to show you this image, which uh, is the event display of a single collision. And each of the lines you see here uh, is, a, is a trajectory of a particle that has been produced. So um, this is an image from ALICE, which was built to study the quark gluon plasma, but all LHC experiments study these collisions and learn from them. And um, by looking at how these particles are produced, in which directions they go, what type is produced, we learn about the evolution of the early universe and about a fundamental theory of physics, which is called quantum chromodynamics. Since LHC started colliding the lead ions, a number of important discoveries have been made, and I can just pick out two of them. And one interesting one is in the area of so-called jet quenching. So with the research we did, we could show how dense this quark gluon plasma is, uh, it is so dense that it actually can absorb the energy of very energetic objects called jets. So I have a cartoon here on the left side, which shows two energetic objects. They're always produced in pairs and fly in opposite directions. And um, depending where they come from in the quark gluon plasma, only one of them may be absorbed. And this is illustrated on the left, but that's a theory, theory illustration. While on the right, you see what you actually see in the experiment. So here you see in the bottom left corner of this image, you see a, um, see the remnant of one of these objects. It's still there. You see a large blue and red bar. Well, on the other side, they are just small ones, and it has disappeared. Also, I like this comparison because on the left, you see something which actually is only 12 femtometer large, so 0.00000000012 meters, while on the right, it's the size of the detectors we have at, uh, at LHC, and uh, the size you see there is about 10 meters. A second very interesting discovery which we made at LHC concerns, concerns an interesting particle called the JPSI. This particle is built out of a charm and an anti-charm quark and was discovered in 1974. And it's an interesting object because when it goes through the quark gluon plasma, it doesn't survive, it melts. The plasma is too hot, so the charm and the anti-charm don't stay together. So typically, in a lead-on-lead -lead collision, you find very few of them. However, at LHC, there are so many charm quarks in a collision that when the plasma has cooled down, it can happen that they find themselves again and form a new JPSI. So I tried to show you a cartoon here on the left, where in the, in the, in the le top left, you see you just have one charm and anti-charm quark. They're shown here in blue. And they, once they melt, they don't find each other anymore. But the situation at LHC is that we have many of them. Here they are shown with the green, blue, black, and orange uh, circles. And then you may just randomly have that some find each other again. So the right side shows how we physicists look at this. So this is a histogram um, which uh, shows you some red points, which are higher than the blue points. And that tells us there are more shapes I have been found at LHC than at earlier experiments. So, and this was actually the initial discovery of this so-called regeneration of the JPSI, which had it all before predicted by theories, but not been seen. 
So these were just two examples of the many insights into fundamental physics which we have discovered. Wow, absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, Jan. So uh, assuming now that we've we've got this information, we know how this, you know how super we sorry, we know how the standard model works, and we know about the Higgs boson, and we've been probing uh, this the early universe. So so now, assuming is it enough to say that we now have all the ingredients to build the universe using the knowledge that we have, uh, Barbara? Yes, and no. <laughs> Uh, because uh, many of us uh, mentioned the matter and antimatter. So one of the big things that happened at the beginning of the universe is that uh, matter and antimatter formed in the same amount. Uh, and uh, if they form in the same amount, then they can, uh, in some sense, annihilate and transform again in energy. And this uh, would leave uh, an, an universe without matter and uh, without us. So we need some difference between matter and antimatter. And this uh, uh, is related to uh, something that uh, we physicists like a, a lot, that are the study of the symmetries. Uh, I will not go into details, but uh, let's, uh, let's start thinking to left and right. Uh, we, uh, uh, we want to assume that uh, uh, physics, the basic uh, laws of physics, uh, uh, do not know anything about left and right. So they should be the same. Uh, if uh, we turn just uh, our experiment in the other direction. And so, uh, and the same is for, uh, for uh, the charge. Uh, if uh, we reverse all the charges, uh, so the positive and negative is something that uh, uh, we invented just to call different charges. And this was, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, true for, uh, for many, many uh, years, many centuries. Voila. But at some point, uh, uh, this fact that uh, left and right are, e are equal for basic law of physics and uh, plus and minus charge are equal was not more true for uh, a kind of uh, interaction. So it was true for a uh, strong interaction, the one thing, thing put, mm, taking all to the quarks all together in the, in the particles. But it no, was not true for the weak interaction that the, the one responsible for, for the sun. I was hinting this before. And so this is called parity uh, violation. Uh, this means that weak interaction uh, uh, changes if we change the orientation and the charge of the system. This is a bit strange, but this uh, has been confirmed first uh, and found first in a kind of particles called, called kaon, kaon, in kaon decays in the 64. Then again, uh, in a particle containing uh, a, a big quark, it is, it's called beauty particles, and this was uh, the major success of the Babar and Bell experiments, one in the US and one in Japan. And uh, these two were related uh, only to quarks uh, of uh, uh, down type. Uh, while uh, uh, recently in LCB there has been found uh, the CP violation, uh, so this is the way in which we call the difference between matter and antimatter, also in uh, charm decays, so in particles containing uh, a quark of uh, uptype. And this difference uh, can be an hint uh, for the, ex the existence of uh, our universe because tell us that uh, matter and antimatter are different, uh, but it's not enough. Uh, we are out of something like eight, nine order, orders of magnitude. So we have to continue to search and what he, we are uh, doing uh, now. The, the, real, the, the fact of the different, the existence of, uh, of antimatter is not uh, uh, in, in appeared uh, while studying the beginning of the universe. It was a kind of out of the blue when uh, one of the founder fathers of the quantum mechanics, uh, Dirac, was trying to understand the electron, the basic normal uh, electron. And uh, he was able to find uh, a, a theoretical way to describe the electrons, only introducing a, a partner uh, with the opposite charge. This was really a kind of mathematical artifact, uh, and he uh, was in doubt if public or not this uh, is result. But in the end, he decided uh, to go with the, the publication. And so he assumed, he uh, hypothesized that uh, existed an anti-electron. And this was found a few years years later in the cosmic rays again. So this is a fantastic idea of uh, find, uh, inventing something to solve uh, a theoretical problem, the description of the electron, and then finding this invention in, uh, in real life. And uh, this is not only this is fantastic because it is an idea of us and then uh, it become, uh, becomes real, but uh, 
while uh, as scientists continue to study matter antimatter difference uh, until uh, nowadays uh, this uh, in the 60s uh, became a way to uh, uh, diagnose and cure cancer so the idea of injecting i try to be really basic trying to inject uh, some antimatter this is possible uh, using some uh, uh, nuclide uh, in uh, some glucose enriched by uh, special uh, kind of uh, isotopes so we can inject antimatter in the body of a person and then use this to diagnostic or cure a cancer obviously this was not the idea of uh, Dirac or none of us uh, is studying uh, physics uh, uh, or tr is trying to understand physics just uh, because then we can use this but this is something that happened many many times in many areas of the science and uh, we hope that this will continue with the future uh, development and, uh, and detectors well, thank you so so much Barbara and that's a really important point I think that, that so much technology and other things has spun out of, of what's been created at the, the Large Hadron Collider that uh, yeah it, does, it actually does end up benefiting us all even despite the uh, the increased knowledge of, uh, of the standard model and so forth as well. Um, so we've talked a lot now about what's happened and what's been going on and what's happened in the last 10 years so now I'd really like to move on to the future so um, you might have heard that the Large Hadron Collider is going to get upgraded. So I think we've got a short video that will show you a bit of the upgrade process. So, uh, just incidentally, I think uh, there is, uh, they're probably are Pantone colours for CERN blue and CERN yellow because they kind of crop up in a lot of these videos. Um, Sidan, can you tell us a bit about what we were watching there? Yeah, sure. I can't tell you about the colours. But, um, yeah, you were just seeing some um, upgrade work being done on the LHCB detector, uh, which is one of the ones um, we mentioned um, earlier. So, one of the questions that comes out from this is, you know, why upgrade? What, what do we mean by upgrade? And uh, that's kind of some of the things I want to talk about now. Um, to, to really understand that, we do need to understand a little bit the way that the LHC operates. And in particular, the fact that we run in cycles. So we kind of run and we take proton data and heavy iron data for about three years, four years. And then we have maybe a two year shutdown. And we do this kind of repetitively. And the reason that we have these shutdowns is because we're really dealing with such a harsh environment in terms of, you know, the, the equipment is uh, under very, very severe radiation. There's a very strong magnetic field. It's 100 meters under, underground. I mean, it's not easy to get in and replace things. And so we kind of try and accumulate uh, some of the problems and then we kind of go in uh, in a long period and where we can really get to the heart of the detectors and really make changes that we need to. And of course, technologically, things will obviously improve and we want to try and get the best stuff in there so that we can get the best physics out. Um, we're actually in the middle of a shutdown uh, at the moment. We're in what's what we call long shutdown two or LS2. Um, and then that, that will run until um, the start of 2022. And then we'll start taking data again for three years. So in fact, the next 10 years, it's going to be really exciting. So we're going to have a, a data taking period, 2022 to 2024, where we're going to try and uh, we're going to add to our data set and hopefully discover some interesting stuff. And then we're going to have uh, another long shutdown, imaginatively called long shutdown three. So this is actually quite an important shutdown because in long shutdown three, we're going to really um, change a lot of things. So the LHC itself is going to replace and upgrade huge numbers of its magnets and its core components. And Atlas and CMS in particular are going to essentially rebuild their detectors. The reason that they're going to do this is because of the LHC upgrade. We're going to get a lot more data than we get now. And therefore, the environment is going to, is going to become even more difficult for us to actually um, to deal with. So if I show you uh, one of these pictures, 
So this was actually one of the, the Higgs event displays, which just basically shows a visualization of the detector. And, and as you can see, there's a lot in the middle, you can see a lot of lines, there's a lot of overlapping stuff going on. Now, if I showed you what that looks like when we have say 80 overlapping collisions, this is what it looks like. And you can see to try and sift through all those things and actually figure out what's interesting and find what we actually want is not, uh, not an easy endeavor. And this is actually going to almost double when we go to our, our next big upgrade after long shutdown three, what we, what we call a high luminosity LHC. So you can imagine that the detectors really have to be upgraded to deal with this type of environment. And that's something that we're, you know, really drives us forward. The fact that we're going to get all this extra data, there could be loads of interesting things hiding in it. And we want the best, the best detector that we can actually have at the time to get the most out of it. One interesting thing, uh, that I should mention is the amount of data we're going to get after long shutdown three is actually so much bigger than what we're getting now that right now, if we talk about the whole data set that we expect to have in the next, say, 50 to 20 years, we've only got 5% of it now. So actually a very small amount of it that we have to find new physics or to, to do all the studies that we want to. So the fact there's still 95% left to come uh, really drives us on and really makes us excited about, about the next 10, 15 years to make sure that we can actually address it the best we can. Oh, that's absolutely fascinating, Sudan. And what's interesting actually in sort of what you were talking about there is a lot of people at home will be familiar with doing upgrades on their own technological setup. Um, usually that would be their kind of PC or you know gaming laptop or whatever it is they use. And probably the thing that a lot of people will upgrade would be their graphics card. Um, so I think Barbara, you're gonna tell us a bit about how the LHC scientists are effectively doing the same thing. Yes, uh, in fact, I Sudan mentioned a couple of very important things for, for all the four experiments. That is, uh, uh, we had to trigger, so we had to select the events, uh, and we are going to have more and more data, more complicated. And uh, for uh, selecting this data and analyzing, we use both electronics and then a so a kind of fast selection. It's typically called the trigger system, an hardware trigger system. And uh, also, uh, then we analyze the, the data using the, the software, the, the, the CPU. And uh, already in this uh, long shutdown too, uh, all the four experiments are starting to think how to improve this, uh, this, uh, uh, this capability of, uh, of uh, uh, analyzing a lot of data. And uh, one of the idea, okay, for in particular for LACB is a, uh, is a major change because uh, the experiment removed completely the hardware trigger and uh, the trigger become uh, only uh, software. So uh, we are going to analyze something like 30 megahertz of events uh, uh, just using uh, CPUs or GPUs. So the collaboration and uh, together with the other, uh, all the four, uh, try start to understand if uh, it was better to continue to use uh, CPUs like we did uh, in the past or start to use uh, GPUs. And GPUs has a, a different approach in calculating uh, uh, things. Things for us are the, pro the characteristics of the event that uh, we, uh, we collect. And uh, at the end, uh, we decided to start to go with uh, GPUs. And uh, it's fun that uh, we had to, uh, obviously, to, to buy this and to find the, the right GPUs. And uh, we, so we go to the commercial one and at the end uh, we, we have a lot of gpus and one of the problems were to try to test these uh, uh, 24 hours seven days and at some point we had the idea of uh, inviting some teenagers to to work to just to play maybe fortnite or something like this on uh, on our system but then we decide to test in a more uh, uh, reliable uh, uh, way and so each of the four experiments start to use gpus this is an important step because the GPUs are developed for other um, goals outside physics. And this is true for, for many, many aspects of the computing. The high energy physics, uh, on, on the one end, uh, is driving the advances in computing. Uh, on the other end, uh, it starts to use advances made outside uh, science uh, just to have better performance. And uh, so we are going to, to use GPU and uh, once the, the events uh, uh, will be analyzed and so we will 
know how, uh, which event we had to write on disk, then we had to manage, and as Dan was, uh, was mentioning, the amount of data that uh, the four experiments collect is only a tiny fraction of what we are going to collect in the next years. And so another big problem is how to store, where to store this data and how to analyze. The, and for this, uh, uh, it has been created many, many years ago, the grid, which is a kind of network of uh, uh, storing, storage, and uh, computer all around the world. And so uh, we can just use this uh, enormous facility that uh, is hosted in many places, uh, in many institutions around the world. Uh, and so each of us can analyze the, the data just sitting uh, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, his or her laptop using this enormous facility, which is maintained by uh, a large community of experts. And so this is again a good exam example of collaboration to make the science uh, uh, advance. Fascinating. But of course, uh, as Sudan was saying uh, earlier, it's not just the sort of uh, technology and the sort of processing power that's being upgraded. It's the actual sort of hardware and the luminosity as well. So Jan, I believe you're going to tell us a little bit about the sort of hardware upgrades that we can expect. Absolutely. So all experiments are undergoing major hardware upgrades. Uh, for instance, uh, Alice and LHCD currently work on improving. Jan, can you just try to turn your camera on? I think it's gone off. Hold on. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think there is a problem with the with the bandwidth. At oh, the it's okay. I Don't turn worry. it on as soon as it works again. No problem. So yeah, we see here even our technology doesn't always work. So um, I was saying, um, as I mentioned before, all the experiments undergo major hardware upgrades. So for example, Alice and LHCD currently upgrade uh, such that we will be able to take hundred times more data once LHC restarts in 2022. And Atlas and CMS are preparing for large upgrades in about five years, and they will build almost their whole detectors with cutting edge technology. So these uh, detector upgrades are based on a significant detector R&D, so research and development, which actually happens at CERN and the Collaborating Institute. So, Institute. so one example of this R&D, which I would like to, to speak about, is the one on so-called monolithic active pixel sensors. So what uh, is hiding behind this uh, complicated word or complicated device? Well, an active pixel sensor, most of you actually have, uh, most likely even several. So the camera in your mobile phone um, actually contains a pixel sensor, and um, this is used to capture images. And we use the same technology to trace particles. Just we use lots of them and very advanced self-developed sensors. For example, for the Alice Pixel Detector, 24,000 of those sensors are used. So this, you can imagine this is like a huge digital camera, which would have 12 gigapixel or 12,000 megapixels. So I uh, like to show you here on the left uh, top side, which is shining in golden, uh, part of this detector, which will be actually installed in the next few months. So uh, this is still in the clean room and will then be lowered into the cabin. And the sensors that are used in such technologies, you can just buy them uh, in industry. They're customly designed for the LFC experiments uh, by engineers, uh, electricians, etc., etc., who work with us. And such designs often push the technology limits. So these monolithic active pixel sensors are a new kind of pixel sensor, which is uh, produced in a, in a chip factory as a single chip, while all the present technology always needs two different chips, which are then glued together. So doing this in one chip allows us to produce extremely thin and light chips. For example, the ones which are in the detector on the image are 50 micron thick, so 0. 0.0005 meters, and that's thinner than a human hair. And uh, we don't stop there. So the currently ongoing research and development plans to reduce this to 20 microns and to curve them. And if you imagine you could have them curved, then you can actually bend them around the collision region. And um, when you do that, uh, you, you have a much better coverage and detection of the particles that are produced. And there is a message I would like to give you because I was personally involved in this exciting research and that is not everything happens uh, with lots of technology in a lab with a white, uh, white coat. So these three images which you see in the bottom here was an idea of a colleague who said, okay, let's uh, try to bend this sensor. And this was done with a, with a double-sided tape roll, which you see here. So from the left to right, you see how this is rolled over the, the actual pixel sensor and it glues on it and it's curved after that. So um, this was an exciting moment. I took these pictures myself. And of course, you can imagine that uh, that is not something that then we can connect electrically, electrically and used. 
but uh, it was the first demonstration of this bending. And in the top right picture, you actually see now how this is connected electrically and put in a test beam and actually used uh, for detection. So the aim here is to make these much larger, up to 20 centimeter large, and then bend them around the interaction region. And this allows to make extremely thin detectors. We actually call them massless detectors with a smile. And um, we hope to install such a device for the first time in the next shutdown of the LHC, so in about five years from now. And who knows, maybe such sensors will also in the future be used in mo by mobile phones or other devices. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Jan. So, We've, uh, we've been doing the stream for about an hour or so. We are slightly overrunning, so sorry about that. But I think we've now reached the point that probably everyone's been waiting for, right? So we've talked about the history of the LHC, we've talked about the standard model, we've talked about the upgrades, we've talked about the processing power of the hardware. So I think now this is, I was going to say this is the $64,000 question, but uh, I think the LHC has already cost $4.75 billion. So this is the $4.75 billion question. What are we actually going to hope to find in the next 10 years? What particles or other things or do we hope are out there? Monica. Okay, so I'll try to answer this. Uh, this uh, one, uh, I don't know how many billion questions. Um, I mean, many things. Uh, let's say this is the short answer. I mean, there is uh, there is an enormous uh, physics program from uh, from the experiments. It's it's really and this is involving really thousands of physicists. I mean, uh, and uh, and it's 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 quite a big uh, program and and it's very very exciting. I mean, starting from uh, now, uh, Jan already showed just now the uh, the Alice uh, upgrade. And, uh, and and Alice is actually hoping to to do more studies and more detailed studies on the quark gluon plasma and to understand its uh, its uh, how it, it really acts and, uh, and its inner components. Um, but perhaps I mean a very long program of uh, future things is is at the GT, GDPs so Atlas and CMS and also LACB. Um, I think one key point that maybe uh, I mean taking up from what Sudan was saying I mean that that yes we are planning to increase a lot of the data sets so so the the part of events from which we are looking for things I mean that is a very important concept people usually think about about the energy, the very high energy, but even the statistics, I mean, how much data we have, it's very important because if we have to, to tackle very rare events, I mean, exotic, uh, very exotic events, we have to have a lot of data. And, and this is true for, uh, in order to improve uh, the precision, but also in order to find new physics and new physics that could lie even in the newly uh, understood Higgs sector. So, uh, so for the Higgs, I think uh, perhaps the, the key example is, uh, is is the fact that um at the high luminosity LAC, we would be Atlas and CMS would be able, I mean, to uh, to to observe, um, I mean, or at least to declare evidence of the so-called di Higgs production. So, if it's hard to find a Higgs, I mean, you can imagine when you have the pair production, this is an even uh, rarer process. And, and this might seem uninteresting, but it's actually a very very. This is the ultimate test of the standard model, and if we find a deviation there, that's definitely a sign of the of the physics and it could even tell us where new physics is lying uh, and of course i mean with with more data and higher energy and we have the possibility to explore uh, i mean at, uh, eight to ten tera electron volt uh, mass of new particles for instance and we can explore many many new models for dark matter this is something that for which we have just some some hint now but uh, but we'll have more and last but not least i think it's in, it's important to say that uh, in all the data i mean in all the events and the studies that we are making uh, we we do see that uh, that there are things that uh, that are interesting that uh, we want to follow up because there are little fluctuations and uh, and and kind of uh, uh, i mean interesting hints that uh, might turn out to be nothing or might turn out to be something interesting and perhaps i mean maybe barbara you want to say something about the lscb and all it or something um. like that Yes, uh, these are not uh, really uh, LACB anomalies uh, uh, because this has been uh, found uh, uh, also by other experiments. So uh, again, is uh, the game of comparing uh, uh, theory versus uh, experiments uh, results? And uh, in the standard model, the theory uh, says that uh, electrons and muons behave uh, in the same way, and also muon and tau. So all the leptons should behave in the same way. It's called the lepton flavor universality. And uh, 
uh, there has been I mean, found that some difference between the behavior in electron and muon. We in the jargon we call the RK class measurement, and some difference between the muon and the tau leptons. Uh, this has been found by Babar and Bell experiments, and then uh, uh, confirmed by uh, LACB. Uh, this, uh, even though many experiments uh, find some evidence, uh, uh, it can still be, be that uh, the, uh, this, that this uh, anomalies, this difference between theory and, uh, and uh, experiment, disappear with uh, studying uh, new data. Uh, LACB um, has already a lot of data collected in uh, RAN2 and uh, we hope to publish the results in the next uh, months or years, depending on the, on the channel. But more will come, uh, hopefully, in, uh, in, in, the next, uh, in the next runs. And uh, any in any case, both if, either, if, either if confirmed or uh, not, the information that we will have up with, um, from these anomalies will be important to build, uh, which is the uh, possible new thesis that we, you was uh, hinting. Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, if I have one more minute, maybe. I mean, I know we are in late, but just uh, just one more thing. I mean, this is this is actually where we are supposed to to look for things. I mean, you see, this is the environment expected at the high luminosity LAC for uh, Atlas and and CMS. Um, but I think I think perhaps also to. To, to kind of ramp up, sometimes we, we, we uh, yeah, it, it looks like that we are, uh, we are uh, um, doing things that perhaps we were already doing before. Uh, but the reality is that, uh, that uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting how the more time we pass and the more time we, 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 we get to work with these detectors and the more ideas, uh, experimentalists, as experimentalists, we get to, to use and to exploit them at best. And um, perhaps a good example of that if you if you uh, if you can follow me for one second this is a sort of transversal view of uh, uh, the typical gdp detector so atlas or cms and now i mean if you remember at the beginning i was thinking about the new particles that might come from dark sectors or uh, uh, other uh, exotics uh, um, standard mo um, beyond standard model theories, and it turns out that many of these models might come might might lead to uh, to part particles that are really weakly interacting with any standard model particle and might be very slow and uh, they might decay or behave in a, in a slightly unconventional way. So this is what this, uh, this, uh, this graph shows uh, that these uh, this particles produced in the center of the collision might give a very, very peculiar signature. And the fact that we have really spent time to understand our detectors uh, uh, now and that we are planning for for, uh, for new brand new detectors for the future that we really know a lot and that they are really cutting edge technology as Jan was saying. I think that uh, it will open uh, even more uh, roots of uh, what, uh, what we were thinking at the beginning when starting uh, this, uh, this journey. So I think that, uh, that I, would, uh, I would leave it there and, uh, but, uh, but just to say that, that there are many, many ideas that are coming up and uh, this is just one of them. Wow, that's incredibly exciting, Monica. Thank you so much for that. So that uh, brings us to the end of the presentations bit. But just before we uh, throw over to some questions, and I've noticed there's been loads of great questions in the chat. I've got uh, about 10 minutes or so. I think we can try and put as many as we can uh, to our fantastic panel. And haven't they just been brilliant? Um, so I think this is a good question from Steve Dunn. Uh, I might put it to you, Sudan, because I think you were talking about triggers the most. But, but anyone else, uh, feel free to chip in. Uh, Steve asks, does the fact that you have to use triggers in the detectors lead to an unavoidable selection bias? Because obviously you're kind of triggering things that you think are going to be interesting, but are we base, basing what we think is interesting on our standard model? Um, and, and what about all that data we're chucking away? Do we randomly take bits of it to make sure we're not throwing away anything important? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, and question that um, we ask ourselves, uh, people that work in the in the community and on triggers uh, quite a lot actually and you you're absolutely right we have to be very careful about uh, biasing ourselves and we do have certain things that we try and do to make sure that uh, we don't do that we try and collect samples of uh, what we call actually unbiased events uh, to try and make you know really using the terminology of the question to try and to try and compare to to make sure that we are 
we have kind of control samples um, to, to, to study, basically. Um, another part of that question, I think, was to do with, the, yeah, yeah, are we throwing away things that we don't, that we don't know about uh, because we're kind of basing our triggers on the standard model? Again, that's really interesting. And so, you know, one of the things that we do to try and combat that is in our kind of triggers, we try and have kind of quite loose criteria, like quite general criteria, and we try and capture as much as we can of that. So we're not trying to focus too much on things that we just know. Um, one example of this, if I if I have 30 seconds, is, you know, when we, there are certain particles that might escape the detector. And if they escape the detector um, and we don't know about them, it creates a momentum, what we call a momentum imbalance. This is something that we can try and trigger on because it's a signature of lots of new physics, not just one particular model of new physics. So if we develop a trigger based on, say, that type of variable, which we call missing energy, so it's like momentum imbalance, then we should um, then we should capture lots of things that we don't understand, basically. So uh, we can have a large sample of that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. I hope I've uh, answered uh, most of it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was great. I don't know if anyone else wants to contribute anything or if you're happy for me to move on. Um, so uh, a, a word has been coming up a lot in the chat, and I, uh, actually I've, I've just noticed that uh, Caleb, Faith, and, and Naka uh, in the chat have said it's 2.23 a.m. here, so thanks Caleb for staying up, and I will therefore ask you a question. Um, but a lot of other people have mentioned this. Uh, they've mentioned the word graviton. Um, now, does anyone want to talk about what a graviton is? Why are we looking for it? What have those theorists come up with? Um, Monica, would you, you, you've uh, reacted to that one? Yeah. Yes, I can go with that. So, so okay, the graviton, I, I only mentioned uh, uh, the word extra dimension, but I didn't mention the graviton yet, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, the graviton is, let's say, is the equivalent of the photon for the electromagnetic force in the case of gravity. And uh, But it's, it's very different from, from that because gravity is very different. So um, now the graviton can have, depending on the hypothesis, I mean, it's not, is not really part of the standard model so you have to go beyond the standard model to 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 try to 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 implement the graviton in the big picture and so depending on the model actually it might have different characteristics and you might actually find it or or look for that uh, search for it uh, um, picking on different characteristics usually the graviton turns out quite uh, it's it's quite a big important part of the extra dimension uh, theory so basically instead of thinking that there are many new particles or new symmetries you think that what we see of our universe is only like the manifestation of the three plus three dimension plus time and that there are a small uh, other smaller dimension that we don't see in our daily life but the, the graviton sees them and uh, and then and then it escapes also somehow it's produced it can be produced at the LSE and then it's, it, it escapes detection so one of the character the possibility to catch the graviton is to study events as uh, that are triggered by this unbalanced energy that Sudan was saying or the other on the other end you can find them as a resonance and this is one of the things for which the high luminosity LSE is going to be great because we can get up to eight or ten TV for these resonances so I mean maybe if the graviton is there we might see it well, exciting, exciting times. So uh, you might have expected this, but we've had a, had a few people talking about coronavirus because um, even the, uh, you know, the pure laws of nature world of particle physics is not immune from uh, current events. So Ken Stowers, or Stowers, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that name, uh, he said, if in 1964 antimatter could fix cancer, can events in LHG future fix COVID? And also some other people have been asking in a sort of more prosaic way. I mean, Obviously, if there's a global pandemic going on. Is this not going to affect the plans at the LHC, or can you all work remotely, or how how does how does it all work? Uh, Barbara, I don't know if you want to answer that one. Yes, I can. Huh. I can comment. Uh, okay, uh, the mechanism on by which the antimatter can be used to uh, cure cancer is exactly destroying uh, the uh, the the cancer. So uh, uh, the idea is to put some. Um, uh, glucose in the in the blood and this go uh, to the cancer because the cancer likes very much the glucose I'm very basic and I'm not an expert but uh, and then uh, the uh, release of uh, the antimatter can destroy because antimatter when meets matter electron and positron really produce energy and this can be used to uh, see this uh, uh, annihilation from outside this for diagnostic 
or just to destroy uh, cells with, uh, with are the, the bad ones. So uh, to cure the coronavirus, we should uh, uh, understand how to uh, put our antimatter on coronavirus. And I think that is not uh, easy, but OK, we think, uh, can think about it. Uh, for what concerned how we manage this, uh, obviously CERN uh, uh, went in lockdown uh, like many other places uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, the activity almost stopped. Uh, we were able to keep uh, essentially the computing center alive uh, so we could continue to work on data uh, remotely. And uh, in the, or, or, so we, we tried our best. And then uh, starting from May, uh, slowly the activity, the activity uh, resumed. This is still difficult because uh, obviously since we are uh, large collaborations with people coming from all around the world, uh, even the, the, the things that we need, the electronics, uh, all the experts that come all ar around the world, is uh, really tough to put all together now. So maybe now we have the expert from UK available, but now the other expert from uh, uh, German, Germany are not uh, more available, or the, some pieces arrive from China is uh, late. So we are re really learning how to, uh, to manage this. This is more for the uh, construction part that is the more important part during LS2, while for the analysis data, probably we were able to, to go on uh, almost normally, uh, like, uh, like uh, without uh, a pandemic uh, on. Hope this uh, answer. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, well. Obviously, it's an incredibly strange and uh, bizarre time for, right. for lots of people. Sorry, Jan, did you want to jump in? Yeah, maybe maybe just to add that because I think the question was also if we had a delay which uh, occurred to this. So of course, by what Barbara described, uh, you can easily imagine there's a delay. So initially, uh, LHC was uh, was hoped in a restart next year. So now we always say 22. So we we think that uh, there's probably a delay of about three months which happened to this, and that we're quite happy about that it's not more. And then, of course, one, one has to see it. Yeah, and while I've got you on the screen, I, I noticed that your job title is, is about analysis of the data. Uh, and Tanish was, was asking, uh, does the data from the LHC experiments, does it get like put online anywhere? Does it get uh, you know, posted to the web? Can, any, if, can I, just as a random member of the public, go and look at the data that you're receiving and come up with my own theories? Yeah, that's, that's a good, good, very good question. So um, indeed, there is an initiative ongoing which is called Open Data. So um, at the, the idea is to make the data of the LHC uh, experiments public so that anyone can analyze them. Uh, for that, you can imagine it's not enough to just give the data out we have, because we have very complex software to analyze it. You need training to know what is in the data to actually understand. You need to calibrate things. So this is actually a complex process, and uh, it will not happen right away. So let's say the head start is giving to the physicists working on the actual experiment. But the plan is actually with a de delay of, uh, of a few years of a small amount of data and a longer delay uh, for, for the full data to make this data sample public and uh, available for anyone who wants to analyze it, which uh, is also one of, uh, of the missions. We, I mean, uh, CERN is, is, is funded publicly, so the data, the research is, all the research that is published is already public, and the idea is that also the data should be public for future research. Fantastic. I can maybe I think maybe I can add. Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Probably you're going to No, I think I, I think maybe Jan said it, but there is already some data which is public, which we take, which we took maybe in 2011 or 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if people are, you know, interested to already, there is some which is available. But like Jan said, there is a delay, so this is not data we took, you know, last year. But if you Google um, uh, certain open data, I'm sure the first link will be the the one that tells you the information that you need to know on that. Yeah, I just wanted to say that this, and in fact, I mean, even uh, with the, with the, some of the students, undergraduate students, so we we also do like uh, I mean, for uh, for a university and educational purpose, uh, we we use uh, this open data to find the Higgs or or uh, like do small uh, proto analysis. So it's it's quite interesting. So they can be used already. So uh, I think we're probably coming uh, just about to the end of uh, the session this evening, but I thought I'd, I didn't even prepare this with you. So sorry, everyone, for dropping this question on you. Um, but uh, I, I guess I was going to leave you with the question. If, if there was one thing that you hoped that would be discovered or found or worked out uh, at the Large Hadron Collider in the next 10 years, um, what would that be? Uh, Barbara, should I go with you first? Uh, yes. 
okay, probably uh, something related to the dark, uh, the dark world, because uh, we are so many compelling evidence or indirect evidence from gravitational, and also our uh, model for the uh, birth of the universe, the Big Bang needs uh, uh, dark matter. So probably uh, hints or directly dark matter or hints about dark matter could be something fantastic that will really bridge two fields that are uh, astrophysics, cosmology and uh, particle physics. So we'll go with this. Fantastic. Uh, Monica, would you like to uh, contribute? Oh, well. I mean, okay, can, can I, I, I would have said the dark matter as well, but then <laughs> I, I should, I, I want to switch because I hold to myself and to the many years looking for this to Susie particles, so I would like to find the stop. So, <laughs> the top <story. laughs> Fantastic. Yeah? So, so recent years have, uh, have shown us actually that um, heavy ion physics and uh, high energy physics with PP collisions is not that far as people thought. Actually, this is growing together because we have seen that uh, effects we see are also happening in the high multiplicity PP and the other way around. And uh, that's a very interesting avenue on the theoretical side. And I would uh, really like to see that we understand that uh, actually there's only one explanation and there's not two for both these systems. Thank you. And finally, Sudan. Yes, yeah, so first uh, Barbara took my one and then uh, Monica, <laughs> then Monica I'm took it. <laughs> so I'm going to say, I'm going to say something maybe more likely that we, we might see. Uh, yeah, like what Monica was talking about, I think if we get to high Lumia LHC and we actually observe the Di Higgs, it will make a big difference to the uh, to the field and really, yeah. you know, be, be interesting because we can use it in all of the models that, that we have and we really need to, to observe things like that. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much for an absolutely uh, fascinating evening. I've been uh, absolutely riveted by uh, everything you've had to say. Also, can I just say a big shout out to some of the people in the chat? I know Lauren's been in the chat answering some questions and Clara as well, who's uh, actually been working with us on some of the videos here as well. She's been in the chat too, answering some questions. So uh, thanks to everyone that's been uh, been taking part. Thank you all so much for joining us, Sudan, Jan, Monica and Barbara. It's been an absolutely fascinating evening. And thank you so much. Thank you Goodbye. for watching. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.